Uh, so greetings, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to the third guest lecture in our series uh, this semester as part of the Anglistic Fives Australian project, charting the Australian fantastic, carried out by myself and Bettina Burger. Our guest lecture today will be presented by Michaela Sounders. Uh, she is Corey and Lebanese writer and a teacher, community researcher, and her writing has been widely published across forms, genres, and disciplines. Michaela has won prizes for fiction, poetry, essays, and research, and her projects have attracted funding and fellowships. She is the editor of This All Come Back Now, the world's first collection of Black Fella speculative fiction, which is forthcoming with University of Queensland Press in May 2022, and we are very much looking forward to getting our hands on this collection. Michaela Saunders is also working on two short story collections and a novel, as well as her PhD project, Guri Futurism, Envisioning the Sovereignty of Country, Community and Culture in the Tweet at the University of Sydney. And without further ado, I will now give the floor to our speaker. Thank you. So I'm just going to share slides because it's a lot more interesting than my face. So, all right, Jingiwala with a bayan, welcome to this place. My name's Michaela Saunders, and as a Guri and Kuri person, it's important to introduce myself uh, so that you know where I belong and to whom, so that we can move through this discussion relationally. I'm a descendant of Darug, Lebanese and Irish people, and I belong to the Tweed Guri community, which is Minjimbal, Gandawa land and part of the broader Bundjalung nation. So. You can see where this black love heart is um, on the east coast of the continent of Australia, right on the Pacific Ocean. Um, located on the colonial border of New South Wales and Queensland, mostly in the northern rivers of New South Wales and on the eastern seaboard. Um, I'm not a Bundjalung descendant, so I don't have a Bundjalung bloodline, but I am Guri by acculturation. Uh, basically, that means I grew up in the Tweed and I belong to the Guru community through my Bundjalung family and other relationships. Having been involved in my community since I was very young through learning and teaching, uh, sports, disability support, research and other community organisation. Uh, Tweed Gurus are the people I belong to and the people who claim me. I'll be talking about this particular country today through Guri Futurism, which is my doctoral project at the University of Sydney. Um, I submitted my thesis just over a month ago, and I've been really enjoying not thinking about it, but I'm happy to revisit it today to talk to you um, about it. So in this project, I'm not claiming to write or speak as a traditional Bundjalung owner because I'm not one, but as a lifelong and active part of my community. And my writing of place and people um, are based in my own lived experiences from which my imaginings grow. All of my academic and creative work to date has been rooted in my community, which is where I come from and where I always return. My work will always be firmly situated in this grassroots community context. Um, and my cultural responsibilities inform my ethical imperative to write Guru Futurism, to give hope to some of our younger people when they think about the future. So Guri Futurism is a new genre of speculative fiction that envisions Guri sovereignty in various futures in the Tweed using Blackfella Futurism themes and tropes. My thesis has two components. Um, there's a creative and there's a scholarly component. So always will be stories of sovereignty from the future of the Tweed. This is the creative component of my project. It's a short story collection comprised of 10 uh, short stories and the scholarly component component sorry is an exegesis in three parts the overarching question that my whole thesis together asks is what might our country community and culture look like in the future of tweed given the reassertion of Guri sovereignty always will be offers 10 different answers to these questions and the exegesis considers the research and the writing that led to the answers. So today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first talk about what Guru Futurism is. Um, 
particularly as a politics of re-sovereignty, a setting of future tweed and a genre of blackfellow futurism. I'll talk a little bit about the origins and lineage of this genre and a personal origin story. And then in the second half, I want to talk about the goals of re-futurism. These six strategies that I've kind of devised to, to achieve these goals. So this is um, how, these are the three main components that I think of Guru Futurism as. So it has a politics, it has a very, um, it's very explicit in its politics and it's all about sovereignty. Um, it also has a very specific setting. So um, it's set in my community and it's a, a genre um, Sorry, let me start again. And it also is a genre of uh, blackfellow futurism, which if you're not sure what that is, I'll go into that shortly. I'm gonna go into all of these. The seed of guru futurism is the politics of guru sovereignty. While there are many generalized and legal definitions of sovereignty um, and many layers to these def definitions, this frame pulls focus to what sovereignty means to gurus, which is the political, economic, legal, relational, and spiritual autonomy that derives from Bundjalung cultural authority. This authority has an ancient history going back all the way to when time began. Bundjalung laws were created at the beginning of time in the Buddha or dreaming by the ancestor spirits who taught these laws to Bundjalung people who then passed these laws down through time, through education and ceremony. Aboriginal cultures are very well known for being attentive to our ancestors, for being traditional, but our people have always been futurists too. Our ancestors have always been forward thinking in looking out for descendants, especially in creating these intelligent and sustainable ways of caring for country, community and culture, and handing these down through the millennia to ensure that the riches um, of life is enjoyed by all, like throughout history. Guri sovereignty has never been ceded to the colonizers and it has never been extinguished by the colonizers law, nor can it be, as it is acquired through a profoundly different basis, that of ancestral belonging to place and to people. Guri sovereignty has therefore always existed independently of colonial crown sovereignty, and it still exists today though it has been denigrated, subjugated and abused by colonial and Australian intercessions. Still, Guris have always exercised sovereignty, often against great adversity from governments and corporations. And this thesis um, and my project contends that Guri sovereignty will always exist in the future too. My project is all about Guru sovereignty being active and alive in every possible version of the future. Anishinaabe critic and writer Gerald Vizenar calls this survivance. Native survivance, he says, is an active sen sense of presence over historical absence, deracination and oblivion. The, na the nature of survivance is unmistakable in native stories, natural reason, active traditions, customs, and narrative resistance, and it is clearly observable in personal attributes such as humour, spirit, cast of mind, and moral courage in literature. Now, the survivance of Guri ways will only endure through the protection and reassertion of Guri sovereignty of country, community, and culture. So Guri futurism is a sovereign-minded futurism that resists assimilation. Spec Fic offers humanity um, opportunities to imagine the seemingly impossible and guru futurism in particular opens up the possibilities for my community to contemplate worlds where our sovereignty is not some utopian ideal but a reality now guru futurism is very specific in people place and temporality and it's named after the demonym used by Bundjalung and Gumbangir peoples from northern New South Wales and the Yugambeh, Kumbamberi and Kwandamukka peoples in southeast Queensland. Now, you might be able to see it here. There's a very faint line. This is the border of New South Wales and Queensland. So this is Bundjalung country, um, but people all around down this eastern seaboard call ourselves Guris. Guru futurism can be set on any of the lands and communities that gurus are from. 
in any version of the future that centers these peoples. In this case, my version is set in the tweed, which is whoop, right here, right on the body. You can see. The Tweed, um, which is shortened from Tweed Valley, is the northeasternmost part of Bundjalung country, named for the area of the language spoken by many smaller clan groups. Bundjalung country mostly encompasses the Northern Rivers area of northern New South Wales and extends over the state border into Queensland too, though it's important to remember that tribal borders were not hard lines like this that were policed or drawn on maps. Rather, they consist of landmarks like hills, mountains and rivers that were mutually cared for by neighbouring nations. Neighbouring and overlapping lang uh, language groups of Bundjalung country are Yugambeh, which is the northern Bundjalung nation, um, covering the Kumbumbari people's Gold Coast area. We have Yugara, even further north in Mianjin or, or Brisbane, which is the capital of Queensland. Um, Garibal to the west, encompassing the Tenterfield area, and Gumbangir to the south, from Yamba to Nambaka Heads, covering the Coffs Coast and inland. Now, I expect these names and places probably don't mean a whole lot to you on the other side of the world, but it's important for me to acknowledge these places. Um, and as you can see, the Pacific Ocean borders Bundjalung country to the east. Guri Futurism is location specific, centering Guri peoples on Bundjalung country. While a pan-Indigenous or pan-Aboriginal um, kind of consciousness may be politically useful for grassroots politics to connect across the continent and show solidarity with each other, a pan-Aboriginal storytelling actually erases local histories of struggle and triumph, which then flattens any uniqueness in our present or future identities and stories. As a setting that connects to future Guru places and features future Guru peoples, then it follows that future Guru cultures must feature in any of these stories. So if you look at this place, um, it's quite surrounded by water. And in the Tweed, there are a lot of rivers and estuaries too. So a future Guru cultural themes would include the saltwater oceans, the freshwater rivers and the in-between estuaries and feature activities such as fishing and swimming, surfing. Um, a future Tweed would also be concerned with current day overdevelopment and gentrification, as well as complex issues of belonging and identity. Now, Guru Futurism is a place-based offspring of Blackfella Futurism, which itself is a sovereign-minded Futurism descended from a global Indigenous Futurism tradition. The term Indigenous Futurism originates with Anishinaabe academic Grace L. Dillon in 2012's, um, got it here, 2012's Walking the Clouds, um, an anthology of Indigenous science fiction which is the world's first anthology of global Indigenous sci-fi. In her introductory essay, Imagining Indigenous Futurisms, Dylan says that Indigenous Futurism is a subgenre of spec fic that grapples with issues Indigenous peoples might face in the future. Paliku academic and spec fic author Amberlyn Clay Mulliner interprets Dylan as saying that Indigenous Futurism describes a form of storytelling whereby Indigenous peoples that is globally and in a general sense, use the speculative fiction genre to challenge colonialism and imagine Indigenous futures. Now, Indigenous futurism is an offspring of Afrofuturism, both of which will be discussed a little more soon. Blackfellow futurism is not simply work that is authored by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and set in the future. Those, those two criteria are foundational. Blackfellow futurism must have a politics. It must be a sovereign-minded futurism. This too will be discussed soon. Um, Guru futurism responds to the genre conventions and protocols of Blackfellow futurism, which draws on traditional Aboriginal storytelling modes and post-invasion histories, as well as many other genres of spec fic. So you can see I've drawn a little um, genealogy here. So we have great-grandfather or great-grandparent Afrofuturism, um, old aunts and uncles, Indigenous spec fic, um, Indigenous futurism, the grandparent, the parent, Blackfellow futurism, and grew futurism. Now, you might not have heard the term Blackfellow or know 
you know, or you might have seen it but not quite know what it means. So let's get into that now. So Blackfella is, for me, in this project, it's both um, a grassroots terminology and a politic. I've used this term as I needed to find an appropriate name to distinguish our work from other global Indigenous or First Nations futurism, such as Aotearoa futurism, which has emerged from uh, Māori and other Pacific Islander storytellers, and to avoid the mouthful Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander futurism. That's too much. Now, as over 300 languages were spoken on our continent before colonisation, there is no one word that we all use to refer to ourselves. The closest such term now, though, would be blackfella, um, alternatively spelled blackfella, blackfella, um, or blackfella, as you can see up here. Uh, this is a grassroots autonym originating in early colonial history. In these first contact histories, our people used the imposed British English language to distinguish themselves as black fellows from the colonizing white fellows, which has become black fella and white fella over time. Both words are now part of the Aboriginal English vocabulary. In its earlier usage, black fella was used to denote a difference in skin color, uniting some 300 of our language groups under one skin. But who are black fellas today? Well, the best def definition that we have is um, that a black fella is a a person of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent, and who identifies as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander, and who belongs to an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander community. This is known as the threefold definition. So to be legally considered Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander, that person must address all three criteria simultaneously. So it's not just if descending from and identifying as a black fella that makes us one, but the belonging to a community who claims us too. This latter point is especially important for a later discussion in, of which texts do and don't belong to the black fella futurism canon. Now the cold hard fact is that any term that unifies us will homogenize us too. But I've yet to find a more satisfying term than blackfella that collects us together as one mob without using English words that perpetuate colonial relationships such as Indigenous or Aboriginal. Many in our communities prefer blackfella over Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander as the latter is externally imposed. Sorry, Indigenous uh, similar reasons, but it also may have us confused with global Indigenous peoples, like First Nations as well. It's somewhat more fitting, but it may confuse us with our North American cousins. Blackfella seems to me the best way to distinguish ourselves without using colonial terms and without borrowing other people's terms or calling ourselves Indigenous Australians, which is not correct because Australia hasn't existed long enough for anybody to be Indigenous to it. In using blackfella, I avoid using one place specific name to speak for all, although I hope to see soon the proliferation of blackfella futurism's offspring and Guri futurism siblings such as Murray futurism, Noongar futurism, Huri futurism, Zenapkez futurism, Yongu futurism, Palawa futurism, Pakana futurism, and many other more, many other kinds of place and people based futurisms. Now, some of our people have a adopted the term black um, you can see down the bottom so b-l-a-k and might wonder why i haven't called this black futurism instead um, this term was coined by artist and photographer destiny deacon who is kuku irab and mer who says she wanted to take the c out of black dr paula bala um, explains it this black womanist act of resistance, dropping the C to de-weaponize the term black is an act of disruption that has grown through use, particularly by young Aboriginal women on social media. Um, now, me personally, I am resistant to using this term. Um, I've observed it become really popular in recent years by black fellas in the arts and in academia. But in my community, we say black fella or black fella. So I'll use the same. Now, our use of the term black and by extension blackfella has sometimes caused conflict with black settlers and people from overseas who want to stake sole claim to these terms and stop us from using them. Some of these people have taken offence that fair-skinned Aboriginal people call ourselves black, 
But this is the way our old people distinguish themselves and now we continue to do the same as we claim our belonging to our people by using the same term. It should go without saying that due to our histories of forced assimilation, many of us do have fair skin these days. So we are not identifying as black as in skin color, but black as in the first people who are of the earth, just like the top half of the Aboriginal flag. Black is in the shadow of history too, as we have our own racialized histories on this continent and we have our own terms that come from this. And so American, British or South African race logics and identities don't fit onto us. Our politics, which include how we identify, um, have grown from our particularly unique past. Arunda writer and unionist Celeste Little says, I tend to use the term black. Why? Because in this country, the term black carries a lot of political weight. It is a word that has power and a term that we've reclaimed. After years of removal policies and stolen generations based on the tone of one's skin and their alleged blood quanta, to state that you are black regardless is defiant. It proclaims resilience in the face of harsh assimilation policies proudly. People sometimes fear that otherness when what they should do is embrace it and recognize that it is important and something to celebrate. Now, black fella, the term encompasses Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples under a common colloquial self um, self given umbrella term, which is fitting as black fella futurism should ideally be concerned with a grassroots sovereignty politics, which is fundamentally a politics of relationship and relationality. Now, the field of futurism written by blackfellas in long and short form fiction and other media is still small, but has grown exponentially over the last few years, and it's still rapidly growing. From 1990 to 2020, our people have published eight novels, one novella, 14 short stories, and one television series. There were even more stories that came out in 2021, and even this year there are more to come out. But I've just I decided to stop at 2020 for my thesis to conserve some energy and just to stay on top of things. Now, of those 26 texts, um, only 15 fit my criteria. These are as follows: texts that are authored by our writers that are set in the future that also feature at least one main character or consciousness who is identifiably a black fella and who exists in relationship with other black fellas. Now I'll get onto why this is my criteria in a second. So first up, we have the Kodaicha Sung by Sam Watson, which I'm holding up here. It, this is in 1990. Um, then we have Land of the Golden Clouds by Archie Willer, 1998. Then we have The Swan Book by Alexis Wright in 2013. And then we have Water, which is a novella, which is in the middle of this um, amazing book called Heat and Light by Ellen Van Nieven. Then we have Clever Man, which is a TV series written by Ryan Griffin. Um, we have a short story called Before the End of Their World by Hannah Donnelly in 2018. The Centre, uh, which is a, a collection of four very short stories which make up a bigger short story from her collection, Black Work. Um, this is a hybrid poetry memoir collection. We have The Old Lie, which is a novel by Claire G. Coleman. A short story by Claire G. Coleman. A short story by Crystal Hurst uh, called Lake Mindy. Then my own story, Berry Time, another st a story by Ellen Van Neven um, called Each City, another short story by Amberlyn Quay Molina. I've spelt her name wrong, apologies to her, just notice that. And then the final two stories are my own two in 2020. Now you can see that most of these stories came out in the last few years. Yeah, so there's been this huge explosion. Um, it started off very slow, this field, but it's exploded in the last few years. And yeah, as I said, even more stories came out last year and more coming out this year. It's, it's, this is taking off now. Now, let's have a look at my criteria. So I said that there were 26 in the future, but here I've only listed 15. Now, why this criteria? Well, 
Let's go back to Blackfella Futurism's roots in its great grandparent parent, Afrofuturism. What characterizes Afrofuturism is the survivance of Afro diasporic ways into the future. Now, out of respect for Afrofuturism, as well as um, all the other kinds of futurisms, Pacifica Futurism, all the other offspring of Indigenous Futurisms, I believe that Blackfella Futurism must represent our people and our ways in the future too. Otherwise, how can we possibly try to understand who and how we may be in the future? To represent us and our ways at the most basic level, stories must be focused through a Blackfella consciousness at the very least. But to represent our people and our ways in the future exceptionally well, Blackfella futurism should be sovereign minded, which means it must have a grassroots politics, which has to be rooted in the relational. As Anne Boleyn Quay Mulliner says, Grace Dillon has described all Indigenous futurisms as narratives of returning to ourselves. And I would add that in so doing, we also return ourselves to the world. Now, I love what she said, but I also contend that returning to ourselves, i.e. a plural ourselves, is a collective undertaking. And this undertaking must be pluralistic in the future too. Our identities as blackfellas are social and relational because our cultures are collectivist and communal. And this must endure in any sovereign minded futurism. So these 15 texts are what I refer to as the blackfella futurism canon, which as I um, said, there, there are more to be added to that from last year and this year. Um, but unfortunately we don't have time to discuss these in depth, but I did want to point out where Guru Future has come from and where, where um, it's situated as a genre. Now, let's go through a little history here, just a very brief one. So Guru Futurism is a place-based form of Blackfella Futurism, which itself is the offspring of Indigenous Futurism. And Grace Dillon, who coined the term, says that Indigenous Futurists uh, decolonize and re-indigenize traditional spec fic themes and tropes to write about native futures, indigenous hopes and dreams recovered by rethinking the past in a new framework. Um, the name and the philosophy of indigenous futurism pays homage to Afrofuturism's rich heritage and similar ways of thinking. Growing from a global decolonization movement was the seeds of what in 1994 would retroactively be named Afrofuturism by white American critic Mark Deary in his seminal essay, Black to the Future, interviews with Samuel R. Delaney, Greg Tate and Tricia Rose. In this essay, Deary theorizes Afrofuturism for the first time, defining it as speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-Americans concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture and more generally African-American signi signification that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future might for want of a better term be called Afrofuturism. Now, Indigenous Futurism and its offspring are of course subgenres of Indigenous spec fit too. Um, I won't go too far into that because I think to a lot of you what spec fic is is obvious but for me I see spec fic as a big and porous basket that holds all the most slippery types of stories together including science fiction, climate fiction, alternate history, futurism, post-apocalyptic fiction, utopian, dystopian, fantasy, horror, gothic fiction, surrealism, magic realism and slipstream. Now, I think of all these genres as, as slippery as they are rooted in consensus reality while swimming in and out of it. Um, these are the kinds of stories that take place outside the bounds of consensus reality, but could maybe happen if or take a few tweaks of that reality. For example, a ghost story could be true and would be true in a reality where ghosts are real. And the same goes with wizards in a fantasy story. Many of the above genres overlap. So for example, science fiction is a genre that thinks about the impacts of technology on society. This is often futuristic too. Futurism is any type of spec fit that thinks about near or far futures based on the known of the now. This is where the speculative part of the fiction comes from. The use of our conjecture to think about what may come out of what is already here. 
Any thinking about any future is speculative thinking. Now, for my Master of Education project, I researched transgenerational trauma and healing in my community and the way that historical traumas resulting from past government policies have moved into the present day. Policies that attempted to bring about our genocide in some way or another. If genocide is the attempt to extinguish our presence from the future, then our survival today is proof that our ancestors' resistance worked. What better way to honour them than to write stories envisioning our descendants thriving into the future too? Throughout 2016, the year leading up to my decision to enrol in my Doctor of Arts degree and begin this project, I read and I watched a lot of science fiction, including Australian futurism, and I found most of the latter sorely lacking. I found that we Aboriginal people, people were either not there in these futures, an artistic genocide, or we were living under even more oppressive futures. But all hope was not lost. In this year, I also read three North American spec fic anthologies that excited me so much, they set me off on my current path of researching and writing my own spec fic, both in creative and critical work. So before this, I had never written um, spec fic and I hadn't really thought too deeply about it um, until a few years ago. In 2014, uh, 2004, sorry, Jamaican-born Canadian author um, Nalo Hopkinson and Indian-born American author Upinder Mayan edited the anthology So Long Been Dreaming, Post-Colonial Science Fiction and Fantasy. This anthology depicts imagined futures from the perspectives of writers associated with what uh, might loosely be termed the third world, with contributions from African, Asian, South Asian and Aboriginal Canadian authors, as well as North American and British writers of colour using various spec fic genres, some of which are futuristic. The short stories grapple with the ways that other colonised peoples engage with some of the struggles that are similar to our own, uh, including genocide, ecocide, dis dispossession, slavery, and other government interference. This one I've mentioned a few times. 2012, Grace L. Dillon edited the uh, Walking the Clouds, an anthology of short stories and novel excerpts with contributions by Native American, Canadian First Nations, Aboriginal Australian and New Zealand Maori authors. Some of these fiction, fictional works are futuristic and some explicate the impetus and the mechanics of decolonisation and the assertion of sovereignty in global contexts. But the anthology does not offer repre any representations of what such a world might look locally. There is one excerpt um, which comes from Land of the Golden Clouds, but it doesn't quite depict Aboriginal people in the future. Dylan's intro to the book and her framing essays for each story provide historical and cultural context for each of the stories. So this makes it a really valuable source of creative and critical work. The last anthology that I'm going to mention is, where is it? Got too many books out. Here we go. Octavia's Brood, science fiction stories from social justice movements, edited by Black American writers Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha in 2015. This offers many examples of futurism that imagine social and racial justice. As the title suggests, um, these stories are inspired by Afrofuturist writer Octavia Butler's work, and many of these are faithful to the traditions of Afrofuturism, which I'll discuss in the next section, which, looking at the time, we don't have a lot of time for. But I do want to say that these anthologies inspired me to want to write my own futurism, not just for my own satisfaction, but so our young people could see some hope in their futures. I wanted to write us into the future and speak back to Australian futurism's absences of us and their forecast dystopias for us. But to do this, I needed to get my own stories published. So my guiding question became, how do I get published? Well, first I had to learn how to write spec fic and write it well, and then put my stories out there. So I enrolled in my Doctor of Arts degree. Now, these three anthologies here I've shown you are part of a global emergence of creative work where Indigenous and other peoples, uh, colonised peoples, are writing ourselves into the future and into other spec 
fantastic genres such as sci-fi, cli-fi, fantasy, horror, and slipstream. The recent groundswell of Indigenous futurism writing builds upon a renaissance of mainstream Indigenous literary fiction, as well as being inspired by the art and philosophy of Afrofuturism and other Indigenous arts. Okay, now we've established the origins and lineage of Guru Futurism, let's discuss the goals and motivations of this project very, very quickly. I'm actually going to skip through quite a few because um, I don't, <laughs> I can't talk that fast. Guru Futurism is a project that imagines who and who we might be and how we might be in the future. My goal for Guru Futurism is to envision creative, sustainable ways of living with climate change and at the same time produce original, entertaining stories that imagine more liberating paradigms than the current state of affairs. Stories that celebrate our ways of being, knowing and doing and becoming. My strategies to achieve these goals can be summarised as asserting sovereignty, making blueprints for the future, utilising black rage, scrying using mirrors, being responsible to Aboriginal readers and imagining outside the dystopian utopian binary. If you can remember the back that far, I mentioned that my short story collection for this project is called Always Will Be. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this slogan or, or where it comes from, it comes from the popular land rights slogan, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, you go to any um, Indigenous rally or protest, um, you'll see it on shirts, you'll see it on placards. Now, this slogan originated in the 1980s through the grassroots Aboriginal land rights movement in far western New South Wales. The phrase is attributed to Barkindji land rights activist William Bates's father, Uncle Jim Bates. Uh, Laura McBride writes, On one of the many trips out on country during this land rights campaign, Uncle William's father, Uncle Jim Bates, became excited and started telling stories of his country and land. Uncle William said, Dad, it's not your land anymore. White fellas own it. And Uncle Jim replied, No, they only borrowed it. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. McBride says that the slogan is an important statement within First Nations communities as it reasserts that the very first footprints on this continent were those belonging to First Nations peoples and that their sovereignty of this country has never been ceded. It is a clear declaration that First Nations people are still here and are never leaving. It is a statement of resilience, survival, deep connection and celebration. Now, I personally wanted to honour uh, Uncle Jim Bates's futurist thinking by adapting his slogan for my collection of stories that never cede sovereignty in any kind of future. Now, in line with its slogan, the purpose of my story collection, Always Will Be, is to imagine the potential ways that Gurus might live in the future after reasserting our sovereignty. I propose that these stories could inspire blackfellas and other people to imagine the possibilities that these worlds could offer and in imagining perhaps invoke a desire to more, move towards more similar societies. I aim for the stories to be inspirational and educational, but not didactic, uh, maybe even a set of blueprints for the future. I want to investigate the opportunities and the challenges that different futures present in the hope that we're better able to imagine the steps to get there if we know what the destination looks like. By performing these philosophies in Always Will Be, I aim to show that a better world, as Arundhati Roy says, is not only possible, she's on her way. Black American writer Audre Lorde's much loved observation that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house can be applied in many different ways, has been applied in many different ways too. For me, to belabor this metaphor that other people have kind of interpreted, I would like to reclaim and sharpen the tools that they stole off us so we can renovate our own ancient dwellings and also so we can build entirely new homes. The tools they stole of us being our own storytelling traditions, out of which has emerged our contemporary literary movement. I come from a storytelling culture and stories are the glue that hold our community together across time and anchoring us in country. 
Our stories instruct, they provoke and they entertain. Yet our stories have been marginalised through colonial subjugation or otherwise appropriated and tacked on to the stories of others. I've tapped into my cultural inheritance, which is my imagination, my knowledge of how communities are affected by colonial violence and the resilience in us all to conjure up some futures where we are not dead or dying. Instead of breathing more life into the restrictive narrative that likes to see us downtrodden and poor, I've written with more sovereign minded thinking. Black American writer Bell Hooks, may she rest in peace, uh, says that it is black rage that will bring an end to white supremacy. All of our grassroots movements, including the aforementioned land rights movement, have begun from black rage, which is a clarifying and a fortifying force and a protective energy that defends our countries and communities and keeps us safe from white supremacy's destruction. In an ideal world, we would not need black rage because our places and our people would not need protecting, but here we are. Professor Chelsea Wadigo says that the radicalism of black power in its rage is its love for black people, a love that extends beyond the self yet centers a collective black self-love, unconditional and unwavering. Thus at the heart of the fight against race are not individual grievances, whims or wealth. It is not a fight for an alternative subjugation, for revenge or retribution, but a call for a different society to be born. One that is no longer structured according to race, but a genuinely shared humanity that if reckoning with sovereignty abandons the hierarchies that sustain white supremacy. Guri Futurism is concerned with our futures and I leapt into this project off the spring, springboard of my own black rage. I am angry at Australia's climate apathy and the normalization of white supremacy and what that might mean for my descendants. And after reading so much Australian and even Aboriginal spec fic, I'm angry at writers who won't give us any hope, even other Aboriginal writers who don't include us in the future. I'm angry at those who do include us, but in marginalised or oppressed or last of their race type of ways. Now, I don't mind my black rage burning brightly, but I won't let it turn into despair. That's why I've created Guru Futurism, to find ways through and out of dire situations. And so transfiguration of anger into artistry is a healing and healthy thing. And not just for me, but the people who I write for. In honouring her own black rage, Bell Hooks was motivated to take pen in hand and write in the heat of the moment. And my black rage inspired me to do the same. So the impetus for this project is both political and personal. For me, they're tied, tied together. On a less lofty level, uh, I'm simply writing a collection of entertaining stories that I would love others to read. But in life, as in art, in both reality and fiction, um, I want to dismantle all oppressive systems and disrupt and redirect the current trajectory of climate apathy, destroy white supremacy today and in the future, including the myths of non-Indigenous exceptionalism, and decolonise and revivify our own fictional representation. The importance of positive or at least realistic representation for our people um, has often been discussed, but it cannot be overstated. Not only does our own fictional representation provide mirrors for us to understand ourselves in different contexts, it can show us ways that our reflections are distorted for better or worse. The problem is that blackfellas have mostly not had any mirrors at all unless they've been given to us by others. Dominican American writer Juno Diaz says, you know, vampires have no reflections in a mirror. Uh, there's this idea that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. And what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections, it's that if you want to make a human being into a monster, you deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. And growing up, I felt like a monster in some ways. I didn't see myself reflected at all. I was like, no, is something wrong with me? That the whole society seems to think that people like me don't exist. And part of what inspired me was this deep desire that before I died, I would make a couple of mirrors, that I would make some mirrors so that kids like me might see, see themselves reflected back and might not feel so monstrous for it. In his 1994 Wentworth lecture, Yarrowal barrister Mick Dodson spoke of the warped colonial mirrors that had been determining our identities and implored, implored blackfellas to throw away the mirror and subvert the hegemony. He he Gently, sorry, it's Friday night here. 
um, over our own representations and allow our visions to create the world of meaning in which we relate to ourselves and to each other and to non-Indigenous people. If, like Dodson says throughout his amazing lecture, a lack of decent representation is partly responsible for the ra racism with, we've endured and we still have to deal with today, it's a matter of urgency <clears throat> to offer representation of our peoples that centre our worldviews, our laws, our values, morals, ethics and relationships. It's one job of the serious artist to hold up a mirror to society, to help society search its soul and examine its condition, to reflect <laughs> on whether we're doing the best we can. I believe that the job of the futurist is to not only examine ourselves in the here and now, but extend our potential to open the gates of the present and roll out a red carpet for our communities into a future where peace, well-being and justice are not just stories in fiction. Answering Dodson as a First Nations writer has motivated me to create my own mirrors that reflect different images of our sovereignty and to use these mirrors to see around the corners into the future. In these abject and uncertain times, it's important for all people to see themselves enduring into the future. But for colonised people whose ancestors survived attempted genocide, it's especially important that our descendants will get to enjoy the legacies that we're trying to build for them. After all, our worldviews and philosophies are as relevant today as they have been for the past countless millennia. And our stories contain the secrets of ten th tens of thousands of years of survival a feat that no other people on earth can boast. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but another strategy is I want to be responsible to Aboriginal readers. So I'm, I'm, I'm very explicit in that I'm writing for my community, um, but allowing others to listen in. And my final strategy is to imagine outside of dystopia and utopia. One way I can uphold my commitment to Aboriginal readers is to navigate between the deceptive hope of utopia and suffocating dystopian doom, which we've probably all felt recently. We will most likely end up somewhere in the middle of these polarities anyways, as we always have, so Brew Futurism intentionally works outside of this binary. Thank you for listening to my talk, and if you have any questions, um, you can ask me now or we can or you can email me. Yes, thank you, Bogawan. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you want, you can raise your hand to indicate that you would like to ask a question. I know it will take a, a few minutes for people to formulate questions as well. Kathleen. Yeah, thank you, Michaela. Um, this has been for a very long time a talk which really engaged me. I'm sorry to all those present whose, whose talks I also listened to, sorry. But but really, I usually don't say I love this talk, but now I do. I've got a I've got a question concerning what you said about uh, you don't like this yeah, well label indigenous and Aboriginal and you prefer black fella. Would it be okay as a as a non-Aboriginal person to also um, use this term in in um, critical writing that is? Thank you. Um, so if you were writing critically about like say do you mean you want to talk about blackfellas as people or as the genre of blackfella futurism or rather the um in my case that would be kind of blackfella gothic well i would still i would probably still use aboriginal gothic because i think until an a blackfella maybe starts writing and articulating a politics around it and calls it that then um, yeah, because it, it would it would be appropriate to reference that if it had already been like kind of if it had come up from um, you know a black fella, um, which is something I actually want to write on soon. So maybe that maybe you'll be in luck. But yeah, I would probably just stick to calling it Aboriginal Gothic until somebody kind of goes like, like lays out a case and stakes a claim for calling it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Victoria. Yes, hello. Can, can you hear me? Is my microphone? I can, working? yeah. I can. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I, I was wondering about the, the role of Guri futurism um, for the engagement with um, Aboriginal languages. Um, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Because, because I was thinking of Cleverman, the show I've watched, and I, I think that 
um, 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 just recently revived language has been used for the hairy people. Um, yes. So I was wondering, is this something common in Guri futurism or is there even a potential in this genre uh, for a revival? There yeah, no, it's a great question. It's something I thought about because I don't speak Bumjalang. I, I, I speak um, like I have interjections that I use that my family taught me for growing up, but I don't speak fluently. Um, I also related to your question. I don't want to own this genre. I want other gurus to be contributing to it. I want this to kind of expand through the contributions of others. And I'm hoping that through other gurus who speak Bumjalang, um, that might come about, but because I don't speak fluently, um, I can't actually write a lot in that language. Um, I definitely, there are definitely a lot of interjections and names for places and um, greetings and things like as much as possible, as much as I know. But um, yeah, sadly, I don't, I just don't know enough of the language to write much of it. But yeah, it's a good question. Uh, another thing about Clever Man. So, the language that's spoken in Clever Man is Gumbangi. Um, it's not actually the language of Redfern where the place is, where the story is set. So it's a language from a place a bit further north. And I've actually wondered about that. I was wondering why they didn't use the local language. Um, but yeah, I, I guess any language is better than none. But um, yeah, just keep in mind that that's not the actual language from where it's from. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Oh, we had two. Who was first? David? I, I think Jeff was first. Okay, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Michaela. It's great to hear you. Um, I I'm, uh, live here in Stuttgart, but I've worked on ah. um, Australian fictions and, and so forth from here. Yeah, I've read your work. I've read your work. Ah, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. It's, uh, it, it, it was really wonderful to get from the other side of the world, um, you, you kind of laid all the, the stonework, the groundwork for your terminology and so forth, and, and um, really uh, thank you for participating in this. Um, I have a couple of questions. One was just that you didn't include um, Terra Nullius in your list by Claire Coleman, the first novel. Was there a specific reason for that? Um, yes. And because would you not see that as, as a Blackfellow futurism? Maybe, maybe you could just answer that one first. No, I don't because there's only one Aboriginal character in it and that Aboriginal character is not a main character. Um, for me, um, that the, the, the character whose name is Patty, um, I'm hoping I'm not spoiling this for people, but the, the Aboriginal character comes in about halfway through the book and is a kind of a hinge that the plot twist swings from. Um, so the story isn't actually about Aboriginal people in the future. It's about how white people learn to live using Aboriginal cultural ways and live the ways that Aboriginal people used in, had to live in the past through colonial oppression. So for me, it's not a, a blackfella text in that it doesn't doesn't centre our communities. It doesn't talk about our kind of struggles in the future. It's a, it's a story about our past, you know. But yeah. Mm. It, it one, one couldn't read those figures of the aliens coming in um, kind of alternately, and maybe that's what she's trying to do to set up this reading where they might be read as, you know, the, the way Aboriginal people experience the invasion, even if, as you say, I think you're right, the interpretation is mostly that it's kind of uh, sort of transmitting to Australians this idea of what invasion is um, by kind of setting it into an alien um, dynamic. But um, yeah. But yeah, and I, I've actually think, you heard... don't think that reading kind of is allowed or or, or is is obvious enough, I guess. Um... I mean, to me, and like to Coleman herself, I've heard her speak about the novel, and her goal was to teach white Australia what colonisation would be like. It's oh. it's not a text about Aboriginal people at all. Um, it 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 defamiliarises um, what happened to us and kind of uses aliens and things to let like outsiders understand what that story might be like for them but no i don't think so i think her other works are the old lie which features a community of aboriginal characters and um story like sweet which features aboriginal teens a community of them that to me is black filler futurism yeah 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if I may, a second question then, um, what, to what, ex I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk in, um, in the intervention of indigenous futures, cli-fis, um, as well as Afro, um, futurism into the sort of raiding the, the, the cupboard of sci-fi, which is a traditionally conservative modus, right? Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's mainly a futuristic kind of white imaginary often. Um, would you like to comment on, on the way that, um, you know, the writings that you're doing and other, um, other people kind of walking in the paths that you've described are kind of altering and changing? To what extent is, is, is that kind of genre and these genres of futures being really radically changed and, and altered by, um, by the writings that, that, um, that you're producing and that you're talking about? Well, so, I think there's two parts to your question. So the 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 the, the sci-fi, the kind of the focus on technology. Now, for me, in my story collection, there's they're not all like you know heavily technology based. Um, and for me, I also wanted to play around with what is science and what is technology. I have a story called Firebug, which features um, our tool and our technology of cultural fire burning as central to the story now to me even though it's not an electronic science it's an organic science to me that's an indigenous science fiction because it's using our ways of using this tool as a as a science and a body of knowledge um so there's that but there's also i mean there, there are writers who are doing way more imaginative stuff than me i'm just a baby i'm just starting out um i'm gonna use alison whittaker's um short story the center as an example if you've read it it's from black work now she envisions a future where there's a place called the center and it's a cloud it's a virtual reality and it's a place where at first black fellas are sent there um, as imprisonment but black fellas actually start to enjoy it and prefer it over reality and the way she envisions this kind of abolitionist but carceral future this gamified future with you know climate change and all these other things in such a short space of words um that's to me really amazing um the stuff i'm writing isn't as clever as that but there are other writers um you know you mentioned coleman she she wrote the space opera um we've got you know Alexis Wright, who has just who has written the absolute gold standard of cli-fi. Um, yeah, and 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 in Carpentaria, she comes up with name. You've just made me think of this of Scientifi. She creates this new world to yes. kind of create yes. a mix of indigenous epistemologies with with you know contemporary science, kind of in that sense. Yes. You know, yes, like yes, yes, as well. Yes, yeah. I think um, and as as I mentioned that like there's 26 work well there's 15 works that feature communities and there's more coming out and i think it's such a new and nascent field and the more people write and kind of get ideas off each other it will grow and it'll proliferate and we'll be able to start to kind of study trends and themes um from what we're seeing but for me i, I wrote a paper which should be coming out this year called and it's basically what are the themes and trends of black fellow futurism and for me i focus on country i focus on community and culture and the trends that i see are a focus on country and eco side and the way that um, people fight for country and in community there's a focus on people coming together to fight oppression and in culture there are um there's there's this kind of twin return to old ways but also the embracing of technology so yeah so it's it's definitely happening out there thank you very much again thank you thank you jeff thank you um david did you still have a question thank you thank you so much michaela and um apologies because um i I'm incredibly late. I just arrived incredibly late to your talk, which I absolutely regret. So please do forgive me if what I'm going to ask is redundant because you've already asked it. But I'm curious about perhaps um, if there are the, the transnational networks, so to speak, or the transnational implications of your concept of, of glory futurism. And I'm, I was wondering because I spotted um, 
bell hooks in your presentation and uh, much of what you said reminded me also of the works of, of Audrey Lord. So, um, and, and I'm curious, um, does, does um, any, any North American indigenous political thought perhaps also influence the way you conceptualize gory futurism? I'm immediately thinking here perhaps of the work of Glenn Coulthard and Leanne Simpson um, and um, Jared Martineau and other, uh, other writers. And I was just interested perhaps in your take on if gory futurism is a transnationally networked concept perhaps in conversation between different indigenous um, political theories and, and how you would read the concept there. Yes, definitely. Um, I did in the earlier talk, I, I kind of outlined a lineage of guru futurism, like its parent, its grandparent, its great grandparent, and kind of uh, made those connections. Now, I go a lot deeper into that in my actual thesis. Um, but for my talk, I just kind of touched on it. But yeah, I, I definitely um, acknowledge that guru futurism didn't come out of nowhere and it is connected to this network and um, it, it borrows and it's in conversation with people around the world but it also has its own unique kind of culture and way of being that doesn't try and imitate or um, replicate other people but definitely is in conversation with with as as any um i think indigenous discipline is in conversation with others around the world you know we all have a lot to learn from each other yeah thank you very much Michaela. thank you that was well, they're very transformative definitely thank you <laughs> thank you uh, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I would like to ask one. And I've, I've been particularly interested in what you've been saying about going kind of beyond this utopia dystopia binary, because that is something that we have been discussing with our students as well, uh, especially in context with uh, Emblem and Cray Mulliner's The Tribe series. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering whether you could uh, maybe elaborate on that a little bit and also, um, I don't know, give us some examples of, of how that features in the text that you've been studying for your thesis, mm -hmm. for example. Well, I can actually just um, read that little bit that I was going to read and maybe that. So my the part of my lecture was called Imagining Outside of Dystopias and Utopias. So one way that I can uphold my commitment to Aboriginal readers is by navigating between deceptive hope of utopia and suffocating dystopian doom. Now, I already said that. Um, now, dystopias always read as horrifying to people who haven't been colonised because it is unimaginable to them that such worlds could exist. But these worlds are horrifying precisely because they are often almost true, give or take a few facts. All of Blackfellow Futurism's fictional dystopias are either replications of our pasts or otherwise they are creative renderings of our lived realities today. Like, for example, uh, Claire Coleman's Terra Nullius is a dystopia because it actually did happen to us. Um, I have found it attractive to write dystopian futures like other writers have. Um, you know, it, it's attractive because it feels logical, requiring requiring little stretch of the imagination as to how our lives at this moment could degrade into more poverty, more police brutality, more carceral strangleholds, or being segregated onto totalitarian concentration camps like in the Swan Book, or being the last of a dying race. These storylines feel logical because they are based on facts of the past and the present. These are the stories that we have been told about ourselves throughout history. However, in this project, I'm not interested in creating new dystopias or replicating old ones. We are already saturated with dystopian images and narratives through conventional and social media. One only need open an app, turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper to be flooded with a myriad of dystopian storylines that our present real world is experiencing. I've also found it attractive to write future worlds that replicate our pre-invasion ancestors societies. However, there are too many insurmountable issues that render this an uncritical exercise or a fairy tale. Many do not know how to go back and some have no desire to go back, but the most salient truth is that we cannot go back. It would be too easy to write stories where Aboriginal people are good and white people are bad, as though our ills are caused by race and not by racism, or in other words, by power and its abuse. I do want my stories to strive towards a kind of utopia according to my cultural values, but I'm unable to objectively categorise these stories as such. 
different audiences will read the stories in always will be as utopian or dystopian but their readings will be a mirror of their own hopes and fears for the future rather than a register of my intentions chelsea wadico um professor chelsea wadico says fuck hope as she says it creates a false sense of security in a moment where there is so much work to be done for our safety and dignity and i agree but in the complete absence of hope there can be only despair Recalling Angela Davis's advice to act as though it's possible to radically transform the world, I suggest we try for a pragmatic type of hope which avoids the deceitful, empty promises of utopia. The hope here is not that governments and corporations will give us their grace out of the goodness of their hearts. The hope is that all of our activism will eventually do something, that we will someday get some of these things that we're fighting for. For me, the, some of these blackfella texts that can be classified as dystopian um, in that the whole society is suppressed by the government, uh, Claire Coleman's Sweet and the Old Lie, Hannah Doll Donnelly's Before the End of the World, uh, Quay Mulliner's A Shayla Wolf um, and all the whole tribe series, Ellen Van Nieven's Each City and Water and Watson's The Kadaitcha Sun. Alison Whitaker's The Sender, Alexis Wright's The Swan Book, and Ryan Griffin's Clever Man. So almost all of them. Um, and look, they're fun to read, but yeah. I want to try and imagine some other things. Great, thank you. Oh, great answer. I, ha I had that already prepared, so. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got to read it out still. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Um, you know, sometimes question times a bit. It's like a bit awkward or whatever. But I, yeah, I enjoyed these questions. Thank you. Ah, David. Oh, yeah, just I mean, and and again, sorry if you've already answered that too, and if that that was already clarified. But would you mind sharing your your slides, Michaela? Perhaps is this is this something that I could 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 oh yeah dare, dare yeah. to ask if if this is something that you would be willing to do. Um, yes, yeah, so I um I, I spoke to Lucas and Tina before and offered to do that, so you can see them. And if you and also because this um, talk's recorded, if you wanted to go back and watch it, um, you can go watch the first oh, bit as well. But fantastic. yeah, fantastic! No, that's that's great, Michaela. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, I've got a question uh, concerning your PhD thesis. Are you going to publish the theoretical part of that PhD thesis? Um, probably not as a whole thing. Um, I'm publishing parts of it. Some parts, no, I won't because I don't know how interesting they'll be to other people. But um, so what the, the, the kind of parts I spoke to you about, that all comes from the first part of the thesis. And I think that I will um, kind of get that out there because it talks not just about Groove futurism, but what I think blackfella futurism is and what it could be. Um, but yeah, I'm actually still waiting for it to be marked. So that's the first step. And then once we see what other people think, I'll I'll um I'll, I'll probably try and put some more of it out there. Okay, so um, well, thank you for everybody for coming and listening to me and for your lovely questions and your presence. Um, it's, yeah, it was nice. I, I thought I'd be sick of talking about it, but it was actually really nice to talk about my research after a little break. So thanks for the opportunity. Yes, and, well, and thank you, uh, Michaela, for, for giving this wonderful talk and answering these questions uh, with, with such good answers. Yes, I also would like to thank you for your amazing talk and all these new ideas that we can now take away from it. And I think I'm not just speaking for myself when I say that we're all looking forward to your publications. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the talks from the series. Um, sounds great. Unless there's any other questions, that is probably the end of today's mm -hmm. event. Thank you again, Michaela. And thank you to everybody for listening, for coming here and asking your questions.